Uh, yes, I, this is my topic here. I have no disclosures. And you've already heard about the mortality in the United States of the 1.3 million deaths of American women. Over 420,000 of them are due to cardiovascular disease. The next leading cause is chronic lung disease, then lung cancer, and then breast cancer accounts for just over 41,000 deaths. So a tenfold greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease, and yet, we understand the screening for breast cancer, but we don't seem to do as good of a job about preventing heart disease. When we say that 80% of heart disease is preventable, is we know a lot of these risk factors, but we don't necessarily treat them. So in this whole discussion, of course, we're framing it around why does sex matter, why does sex and gender matter, and of course, both are important, but sex is biological, and if we don't understand the difference between a biological woman and a biological man, we're not going to be able to understand the innate differences in the, in the medications we use and in the treatments that we use. So for risk factors, I think a lot of people think we know all of this, and I, I don't doubt it, but we seem to address things differently when, we, when it comes to women. In terms of risk factors, there's differences just in terms of prevalence of risk factors, but also in the relative cardiovascular risk based on those risk factors. So for example, smoking is less prevalent in women, but if a woman smokes the same amount of cigarettes compared to a man, she'll have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Diabetes has been well established, saying that when a woman's diabetic, the risk for cardiovascular disease is much higher. Some risk factors don't differ, like cholesterol, but some risk factors are more, or risk enhancers are more prevalent in women, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And although we don't right now know of a sex difference related to them, it's important for us to understand these differences. And this is just an example of a study, this is from the UK Biobank, that looked at specific traditional risk factors and showed the relative risk for cardiovascular disease, where there was differences and where they were not. And the common things like hypertension, diabetes, and smoking were the ones that in the Biobank actually showed, again, this difference. So, just to go through some of these risk factors quickly, I mean, hypertension is perhaps our most important risk factor because of its great prevalence in our population, and it accounts for one in five deaths in, in American women. And it is the one thing that I think we treat the least well. So, um, we used to think we knew everything about hypertension. We thought that the, when, you, uh, when a person was born, there was really no difference. There was, uh, until puberty hit, and you can see here, we thought the difference, you know, that there was a difference between boys and girls based on their um, ages was really that there was a change in blood pressure in men, but not as much of a blood pressure change in women. And it wasn't really until menopause that we thought, you know, okay, there's something that changes. But more interesting work came from Dr. Barry Mertz's group, and they actually looked at these trajectories of the blood pressure change, which really shed new light on this. So if you look at the systolic blood pressure up in the top quadrant there, you can see that although a woman's blood pressure starts out lower compared with men, at, with over time, the trajectory or the rate of increase in systolic blood pressure is actually higher in women. It makes you at least stop to pause to wonder if even our blood pressure thresholds are correct for women. Maybe women need their own threshold for blood pressure. But nonetheless, these are the differences. When we look for differences, we do find them. Now, lipids, I told you, they don't really differ in terms of uh, how they affect men and women, but what differs is how we treat them. So this is just one example. This is from the Palm Registry by Dr. Anne-Marie Navarre, and she looked at this and looked at people both primary and secondary prevention and saw what they demonstrated was that women were less likely to be on a statin, and women were also less likely to quit their statin, usually due to side effects. Now, it is true that side effects are more common from statins in women, but now we have many medications in our arsenal that we can treat women effectively, but we should be at least addressing these issues and understanding that we're just, just not treating them is not the right answer. Diabetes, there is a difference in, in women compared with men, and you can see that you know, this is well established from the Framingham data that is shown here on this figure. 
But this increased risk is always the question. Is it because they have more cardiovascular risk factors, women specifically? Do, is it because of sex hormone differences? Is it differences in inflammation or adiposity? Or is it inadequate treatment? Not just of the diabetes, but of the other risk factors that are present. So all of this might contribute to why we see differences in diabetes. Now, smoking, I just wanted to say that, you know, we have good treatments for smoking sensation, but unfortunately, we don't offer them often to our patients. And we should understand that there is a difference in response to therapies offered. Women are more likely to, if you provide them information about smoking sensation, they are more likely to act on that information. But there is also a sex difference in response to our smoking sensation medications. Medications like nicotine replacement and bupropion, for example, are metabolized in cytochrome P450 by a specific enzyme that's more active in women. So as a result, these drugs are not as effective in women as they are in men, where Shantex actually is a drug that works more effectively in women. So when we're trying to prevent heart disease, we need to understand these sex differences so that we can recommend the right medications. Not always will the same medication be preferable for a woman compared with a man. Now, when we assess risk in the United States, we use the ASCVD risk calculator, and I'm sure many of you use this and use the app. And the good news is, is that it's been validated. But of course, in the past, we've always criticized it because for women, it heavily depended on age in terms of identifying risk. In 2018, though, they updated these and said that we could use risk enhancers to further risk stratify all our patients. And I think that it's important to know those risk enhancers and identify them in every patient. Some of these risk enhancers, though, are sex-specific or sex-predominant, and sex-specific things related to pregnancy and reproductive years, and then, of course, uh, sex-predominant things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, these diseases of inflammation. A pregnancy, of course, can only happen to a biological woman. And pregnancy is really nature's stress test. It helps us identify women who might benefit from primary prevention to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And I love this figure. This uh, it was recently published in Jack, looking at all the adverse pregnancy outcomes and their association with cardiovascular risk. Preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, and small for gestational age all have data associating them with a greater risk for cardiovascular events, as well as other, other things as well, diabetes being one of them that may be on an interesting similar pathway. The one thing I did want to say, though, the 80% of women bear at least one child in the United States, and so, and then adverse pregnancy outcomes occur anywhere in 10 to 20% of pregnancies. So it isn't something that you're not going to see. It's something we actually see a lot, and we should be assessing for those of us in prevention. This should be part of our history taking. Just to show you quickly the data, I don't have a lot of time to dive into this too much, but. You know, this is data from the Northern Finland birth cohort. They looked at all births, uh, um, all women who delivered, sorry, in 1966. And they looked at any type of hypertension. And any type of hypertension increased the risk of cardiovascular disease over time. It also increased the risk of diabetes and chronic kidney disease as well. Well, you, similar data came from the UK, um, from the Caliber study. They looked at uh, preeclampsia and any gestational hypertension and also associated it with a greater risk of many cardiovascular events that are identified um, in this figure. And gestational diabetes. We have a lot of studies looking at gestational diabetes and the increased risk for cardiovascular disease. I just like this study because it was of all deliveries in France, and they compared those with um, gestational diabetes compared to those who did not have that. And you can see just after seven years, there was a greater risk of uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, and angina. Seven years. These are still very young women. And some of the work we did was looking at preterm birth and at its risk of cardiovascular disease. Preterm birth is defined as having a child before 37 weeks of gestational age. And we found that there is a greater risk of heart attack and stroke in this meta-analysis. And this has been replicated by others as well. 
So the potential mechanisms are, are multifold. It could be that people already have risk factors before their pregnancy, and that might be part of it, or something is activated during pregnancy. During pregnancy, obviously pregnancy is a state of inflammation, and so there is things that can change like endothelial dysfunction and other different responses. But while people are teasing that out, the easiest thing is to identify these people when these occur and screening them early and identifying those at the highest risk would be very helpful for us to reduce their future risk. So when we talk about uh, reducing risk across the lifespan, I think this paper by Dr. Mikos led this paper and I think this got used in the Lancet figures, was that you know looking at uh, younger women, different uh, issues related to reproductive health need to be asked there during ages of pregnancy, asking those specific adverse pregnancy outcomes, and for older women, asking different things about hormone replacement therapy and menopause, in addition to the traditional risk factors that we all do ask. I think the under-recognized risk, though, also cannot, you know, cannot be missed. I think it, these are things related to inequities, disparities, and social determinants of health. So things like racial inequities, the social determinants of health, zip code, financial toxicity, health literacy, and environment. And I think it may be hard for us to always be able to ask the right questions, but understanding where someone lives, what they're exposed to. If I prescribe this medication, will they even be able to get this medication? What else can I do for the patient that's in front of me? Because these things matter just as much as the risk factors in terms of their impact on health, and specifically on cardiovascular health. So my approach is simply this. I assess atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk using the risk calculator. That's my starting point, not my ending point. I identify high-risk women, and that includes black women and South Asian women, but also in the United States, we can't underappreciate our veteran women. They are exposed to sexual trauma, and they have a disproportionate increase in traditional cardiovascular risk factors as well as sex-specific risk factors. So that's a group that we really need to identify. And for those of you that work at a VA system and maybe are dealing with them more often, should understand that's a very high-risk group. But even in our regular hospitals, um, a lot of veteran women will not go to a VA hospital and they're coming to regular hospitals because they don't trust the system because of things that have happened to them. So we're all seeing these patients. Then I identify the sex-specific risk factors, many of which I talked about today, and then the female predominant conditions, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and diseases of inflammation. I think that's how you personalize this. I don't need to do a fancy genetic test if I'm not taking into account the differences that I'm treating a woman versus I'm treating a man. So, um, and this I think was nicely summarized by the Lancet article. As you can see here, the well-established risk factors, of course, we need to be addressing and treating. The sex-specific risk factors we need to be aware of and identify when we're assessing risk. And the under-recognized under risk factors are things that we need to dive into a little bit more to know both how to address and how to treat. So thank you for having me here today.